Hey everyone, welcome back, and today we are joined by an extremely special guest here. Brett Coleman is on the channel, and I asked you guys on Twitter for some of your biggest NFL draft questions, so we're going to be answering those, having just a regular football conversation here. Super excited for this one. Uh, how are you doing today, Brett? I'm doing good. You know, it's nine in the morning, so you know I, I got my tea. I'm caffeinated. I'm I'm fed. I'm I'm good to go. You you're a tea guy by the sounds of it, not a coffee guy. I'm both. I'm trying. I'm trying to get on to tea because well, normally uh, I do like six shots of espresso a day, so I'm trying to be like slightly healthier with caffeine consumption. Uh, it, it's it's going okay. I'm I'm learning to adapt right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to be talking about the NFL draft and. Obviously, we're about two and a half weeks away from the draft, which is kind of surreal, um, just how quickly this offseason has gone by. So, like, what are some of the big storylines early on that have you super excited entering this draft? Figuring out what the Vikings and Chargers are going to be doing and perhaps doing with each other. Um, but I think that whole scenario around the Vikings going up to either four or five and how much that decision affects both teams right because we know the chargers want to get out of there they don't want to pick at five and we know the, we know the vikings want to get up to the top five the real question is are they going to to trade with arizona or the chargers and those two scenarios basically transform the entire draft because if they go to four now we're looking at a potential scenario where the chargers are choosing between taking marvin harrison jr or say trading him to either the bears or the jets which again drastically changes the draft if they go to five now we're looking at arizona uh taking marvin well probably taking marvin we don't know for sure but they likely would take marvin uh and then and then you have uh jj going at five and then you have uh a really uh depressed giants fan base i guess you could say at six right that, that have been holding out the hope of hopes that they're going to get either Marvin or JJ McCarthy. And now, now they're getting neither. And so you got to figure out what the giants are going to do after that. So uh, I, I would say those two teams kind of control the draft in a weird way because where that, where and when that trade happens is going to create long lasting effects, not just within this draft, but within the NFL period over the next two, three, five, ten 10 years. Yeah. And, I mean, it looks like obviously Minnesota acquired that extra first. Do you think there's any chance that they're just like, we're just going to stay at 11 and hope one of these guys falls? I know there's all these now smoke screens of Michael Penix could go in the top 15, which I'm a big Michael Penix guy. Don't know if I would take him that high. Do you, do you buy into that hype at all, or do you think those are all just smoke screens to try and force more teams to move up the board? I don't think they would have made the deal to get the extra ammo unless they were going to use that ammo. Yeah. That's how I kind of read the situation. The The reason why I don't think the trade has happened yet is because they aren't sure which quarterback is going to be there yet. Like yeah. I think they might have vastly different grades on the top four and what order they have them in, and I'm not sure they are sure that their guy is even going to be there. Because, and, and and who knows? Like maybe maybe they'll be forced to sit at eleven because of that. But I think they got the extra ammo, intending to use it, and we'll see if they get an opportunity. Yeah, I'm I'm there as well. You mentioned the Chargers as well. It's one of the big, interesting storylines here, and that's been something that on online has been just very interesting. The discourse because it looks like. I mean, you've seen the buzz, like maybe they go Malik Neighbors after they traded Keenan Allen and released Mike Williams, but there also seems to be some buzz that an offensive lineman could be in play there. So where do you think that the Chargers would be best suited to go and kind of give a selling point for why they should go with Joe Alt or why they should take Malik Neighbors or whoever, whichever wide receiver they prefer? Before the Keenan Allen trade, I heavily advocated for Joe Alt. Um and, and, you know, the thing that, that people have to understand about offensive line is it's the only position group, other than arguably quarterback, but even more so for offensive line, it's the only position group that has an effect on every single offensive play, run or pass. They are doing something on every single play. They don't get to take any plays off. 
even quarterbacks, you know, they'll, they'll get to just hand the ball off, right, sometimes. But it's up to the offensive line to execute to open up those holes for the running back. It's up to the offensive line to pass block. So if you don't have the best possible starting five, you will suffer the consequences of that. And we know that Jim Harbaugh is a heavy believer in that. We know that Greg Roman is a heavy believer in that. We know Joe Ortiz is a heavy believer in that. So all signs kind of pointed to to them favoring tackle because in in their view, or at least in their philosophy from what we've seen from them historically, when you have a quarterback like Justin Herbert, it's better to give him time and then let him cook with that time than to give him two seconds to get the ball out to an elite receiver. Uh, I mean, we just saw the Chiefs do it in their division, right? Strengthen the offensive line, and they'll make it work with whatever receivers they got. Yeah. So I I feel like that was the goal for the Chargers, and then the Keenan thing happened. And now I don't know. I still probably slightly lean towards tackle for them, just based on, again, what they historically do philosophically. But the door is more open than ever before for Marvin to be a charger. And I I now think they're one of the most interesting teams in the top 10 because it was so easy for me to just kind of write down and pen Joe Alt for a couple months. And now it's wide open. And I, I got no clue. And I say that as somebody who like works with the organization, even I got no clue what they're going to do. Yeah, I, I do want to ask about the Chargers receiving room because they took Quentin Johnston last year. I'm a big Josh Palmer guy as well. Is mm-hmm. receiver as big of a need for the Chargers as some people seem to think that they desperately need to spend that top five pick on? Because Johnston had his drop struggles last year. There's no questions. But the potential was there. I think maybe a year two you could see some development. They brought in Hayden Hurst, who's a good pass-catching tight end. Is receiver like an absolute necessity for the Chargers at five, or could you see them actually going tackle and then waiting in such a loaded receiver class? I think they need a number one because they don't have a number one. Because, I mean, Quentin Johnson is athletic enough to be a number one, but he's really more of a, at this point in his career, I think he's more of a yak threat. He's like potentially a high end number two that can get explosives after the catch. You know, he, he would be like the Debo to the Ayuk in the best case scenario. I'm not saying he's Debo, but like that's kind of, I think, the role that he would excel in. Um, Josh Palmer, I think, is like, you know, keep it going with the 49ers. He'd be like their Jawan Jennings, you know, old Mr. Reliable, Mr. Third Down. Uh, but they still need their IU. They still need a number one. Uh, and, and this would be the only time I think they would be able to get it. So that's that's what I struggle with is like, do you still think they can get a potentially number one quality X receiver later in the first round if they trade down or early in the second round? It's a maybe because there's only a couple other guys in this class that I think can play that role. So it comes down to, do you think they can still get Adonai Mitchell? Do you think that they can still, uh, you know, maybe get a a Xavier Leggett if they trade down twice? Or, I mean, maybe you're a big Brian Thomas guy. If you think they can still get that later in the first round, have their cake and eat it too, trade down and still get that guy, that's great. But it's... (sighs) It's not guaranteed, and I get spooked by that not being guaranteed, right? So uh, I, they do need a number one receiver. The safest option is to stick and pick one, whether it's Marv or Odunze. Um, but boy, I just I go back to I go back to what they like philosophically, and it's it's not throwing the ball; it's running the ball, and they need a they need a, a better right tackle in order to do that. Yeah, um, you mentioned that you don't know how many of those guys could be at number one. You mentioned Marvin Harrison and Romo Dunze. So you don't have Malik neighbors in that top two. And like, what are some other guys down the board? You mentioned Adonai Mitchell. Who are some of like those receivers that you think could be number ones in the NFL? You know, when, when it comes to Malik, it, it, can he be your most effective option? Yes. But I think he's a different kind of, of of receiver i think he's a slot receiver you can build your offense around a slot receiver i mean lsu basically did that uh mm-hmm. with him because we got most of his most of his explosive plays in the slot um like you you can build your offense around a slot receiver absolutely for sure 
I don't know if that's what Greg Roman likes to do. I think Greg Roman likes to be in 12 personnel, 21 personnel, 22 personnel sometimes and have one guy out there who is a an X receiver that you can rely on to beat press coverage outside. That isn't Malik Neighbors. I think Malik Malik is more Honestly, Malik is more like it's never going to happen, but like Buffalo, we're living in 11 personnel a lot of the time. Well, old Buffalo, now new Buffalo, they're trying to turn over a new leaf and be a 12 personnel team. But old Buffalo, like a year, a couple of years ago, or even the Bengals, I would say are, are a good one too, where we're living in 11 personnel, we're spreading things out. Uh, we have outside guys, but we we really want like a dynamic vertical slot. Like that's what, that's the environment Malik would thrive in. I don't know if, if the Chargers fit that. Understandable. Um, you mentioned Buffalo and how that's never going to happen. You don't think there's any chance that they could give the Julio Jones trade package to move up and maybe try and get one of these receivers post Diggs trade with an extra second. I know there's some rumors there after the Diggs trade. They lost Davis. Similarly to the Chargers, I think a lot of people are kind of underrating the Bills receiver room. Khalil Shakir was very solid at the end of last year, but do you think there's any chance that the Bills could be looking to move way up in the draft to try and get one of those top three, or do you think they're in a position to just stay where they are? I think from 28 is too expensive. But, again, you could sell me on, uh, let, let's say, you know, the, the top couple corners are gone, and Indy after that is like, we want to get out of 15. You could sell me on Buffalo going from 28 to 15 with like a godfather offer to get A.D. Mitchell. And that's that's kind of what I worry about, right? For when we're talking about with the Chargers, like you could trade down in hopes of getting AD Mitchell. It doesn't mean that somebody else isn't going to come back from the twenties and get him. So it's kind of a risky proposition. I think Buffalo is like Buffalo and Detroit are probably the two number one threats to come from way deep in the twenties up to the mid teens and take one of the last like true X receiver prospects. Again, I don't think it'll be top three guys because that's just too expensive to go from twenty eight to like. 10 but 28 to 15 17 18 that kind of range that's a little bit more doable yeah we mentioned the chargers the vikings talked a little bit about the bills are there any other teams that you just kind of have your eye on as like that team is very interesting come draft night and they could go a million different directions which teams are you looking at uh seattle i got no clue what seattle's doing uh, even Seahawks fans have no clue what Seattle's doing. Yeah. You know, it, it could be, <clears throat> it could be basically anything from tackle, guard, interior defensive line. I mean, I think they're okay at edge, but I've seen some people throw out like adding another edge for like the third year in a row to Seattle. Um, I've seen people uh, talk about tight end. You know, they could be like a Bowers spot. Uh, you know, I've I've seen people throw a quarterback for them you know, is, is kind of future proofing uh, for, for like the post Geno era. So uh, Seattle is absolutely fascinating to me because they, there's like six positions that they could go with and they all make sense. And I mean, you want to talk about trade down candidate. They might be a trade down candidate because, because they can go in any direction. And so they know there's probably going to be somebody later in the draft that, that they're going to like. Uh, they, they don't have like one desperate need that they absolutely have to hit. Um, but th they're so interesting, I think, because they're almost impossible to read right now. Yeah, I'm there as well. I'd also throw the Broncos in that mix, too, because every time you do a mock draft for the Broncos, is it Edge, Bo Nix? Is it going to be a corner? That team makes absolutely no sense. What kind of direction are you feeling that Denver should go come draft night? They feel like a natural fit for Bo Nix. Like, it just feels right. Uh, to, I mean, it's early. It's obviously early. Um, but as far as, like, early picks where we acknowledge, like, hey, this this is a little rich for Bo Nix, but this is a spot where he might be able to succeed even if the pick is rich. Uh, Denver, Denver, I think, makes sense because I think he fits what Sean Payton likes in a quarterback. He's experienced, he's professional, he's accurate, he takes care of the ball, he he works the middle of the field, he does a lot of stuff that like Russ just wasn't doing. Um, and so I, again, I, I don't have a top 15 grade on Bo Nix, but if he was going to go that high, and I think he probably will, that is the destination I think is best for his career. And to be honest, it, it for Denver, that might be their best case scenario too, because they got nobody. 
Like they got absolutely nobody to play quarterback for them. Yeah. And they they kind of have to do it, in my opinion. Yeah, I like that. Do you think do you have Knicks ahead of Penix? I do. I do. I have I have Knicks and JJ McCarthy in the same tier. Yeah, I we'll get to that in a minute because I know one of the questions came in was about those quarterbacks, but I'm a Penix guy, like I said, that ball placement and that arm is ridiculous. And honestly, the mobility numbers were a lot better at his pro day than I was expecting them to be. So I'm going to be very interested to see where Penix goes. What do you think the best landing spot for Michael Penix is? Ooh, uh, somewhere where he can, I, I think, be free of interior pressure. So I'm looking at teams that have like strong interior offensive lines. Um, I think the Rams, like him being, if he was going to go in the first round, I don't have a first round grade on him. If he was going to go in the first round, the team that makes the most sense is probably the Rams at 19 because he can sit behind Stafford for a year, maybe two years max. But they have a strong interior offensive line because uh, interior pressure like really, really messes his day up. Um, so I think he could be successful there. And obviously they got they got good receivers and everything like that too. Um, I'm trying to think who, who's realistic. He's not going to go to Minnesota because Minnesota is probably aren't going to have a guy. Dallas is not that stupid. Uh, <laughs> Green Bay, no. Tampa, no. Arizona, no. Buffalo, no. Detroit, no. Baltimore, no. Yeah, I feel like the Rams might be kind of like the last station on the train ride for him to go in the first round. If he gets past the Rams, at that point, you're hoping that somebody's going to come up from the top of the second round and try to get a fifth year option, whether it's like the jets or, you know, if the giants take like Rome at six, but they still want to get a guy, maybe they could, maybe they could come up from the back of the second or top of the second round. Um, but it's, it's hard to find like the right destination for Penix. Cause I think he just needs a very specific uh, offensive line situation. And there's not a lot of teams that both need a quarterback, but also already have the offensive line built. And that's, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah, I got one more question, then we'll kind of get into the questions that were asked on Twitter. Don't have to get into the off the field issues that the Tavondre Sweat arrested this past weekend. Just a quick question How much do you think it affects his draft stock? Does it affect his draft stock? Or is this like a Jordan Carter situation from last year where he might drop a little bit, but he's not going to drop outside the top 50, let's say? You get a lot of leeway if, if you're a player like Carter. Uh, who is one of the best three technique prospects uh, we have seen in, in quite some time. Uh, and again, I'm not advocating for this. I'm just saying realistically, that's what it is. There's yeah. an old saying in the NFL, you know, if Hannibal Lecter ran a four, four, they just called an eating disorder and take him in the first round. When you're that kind of prospect, you, you can have off the field flags and teams are still going to take you because in the back of their mind, they're like, whatever, I, I can roll with that. We need to win football games. Tavondre Sweat is a good prospect. He is not that level of prospect. He can't get away with that kind of stuff. And so, you know, if you're a 350-pound nose tackle who's already probably going to go on day two and you throw in making bad decisions the week before or a couple weeks before the biggest day of your life, bad preventable decisions, mind you, uh, at like 2 p.m. on a Sunday or whatever it was, like then teams are going to be like, all right, what are we doing here? You know? So it, it's one thing if you're Jalen Carter and, and teams will completely ignore, dare I say, sweep under the rug. You're off the field issues. If you're Tavondre sweat, you don't get that leeway. Is that fair? No, but that's just how the league operates. And so I'm sure his agent is fuming right now because a player like Tavondre sweat, an agent is probably investing over a hundred thousand dollars into his pre-draft process. Right. And uh, so that agent's probably pissed right now. But it, at the end of the day, it's on Tavondre. Like he's the one who made the mistake. He knows how important this time in his life is and he still did it. So uh, is this going to doom his career? No. But at the same time, if I'm a team and I'm and I have Tavondre stacked up with a bunch of other guys that I have similar grades on, like, yeah, that that would affect it. That would move him slightly down for me, because if he can't make good decisions during this very important part of his life, are we confident he's going to make good decisions in the middle of a season when we're trying to go on a Super Bowl run? Like it, coaches think about that kind of stuff. 
So where do you think he ends up falling ultimately? Does he go in the third round now? Does he fall out of the second entirely? Where do you think his draft range looks like now? I, I could see it costing him a round because a top 50 to top 60 pick is extremely valuable. And teams want to be sure that they're that they're spending those valuable assets on a player that they think is going to hit. Um, that, that incident puts a question in their mind uh, about – spending that kind of valuable asset on him. So I, I could see it costing him a full round and, you know, slipping from like the second to, to the third, maybe even more. And, and again, I, I don't wish this upon him. I, I want him to, you know, bounce back from this and be successful and, you know, generate generational wealth for himself. Like I, I want that for him, but like, I'm just acknowledging the reality teams aren't going to like this and it, it might cost him in the short term. Yeah, absolutely. That was, was recording a seven round mock and I come back to that news and Tavondre Sweat, I like Sweat over Murphy, which I know is a big hot take, but that one uh that one hurt a little bit. So this video is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the number one fantasy sports app on the market with tons of really fun games that you guys can get on. Whether it be your regular fantasy sports games or you want to get in on a little bit more excitement with my favorite, the higher lowers. They're very simple to play and you guys can get in on the action today by using my code JWAC to get double your initial deposit up to $100. It's a very good deal and you guys can play the higher or lower games. With the MLB regular season getting kicked off, with the NBA regular season coming to a close and the playoffs starting, you guys can get on the action, use my code JWAC for double your initial deposit, and have fun. Please bet responsibly. Let's get into some of the questions that you guys asked. Uh, we're starting off with at Cincy Planner. He says, name a playmaking linebacker which will be taken on day three, which no one is talking about yet. Ooh, taken on day three. This was one of my favorite questions we got. I really liked this question. Ooh, I'm. Do I want to go Trevin Wallace out of Kentucky? Maybe I can see Trevin Wallace out of Kentucky. And he's fast. Like, let me look. Let me look up his, his exact numbers. I remember his RAS was really good. I think he uh, ran a four five six, if I'm not mistaken. Something around there. Uh, four five one. Yeah. So he is a, a nine three three RAS. 451, 37 and a half inch vertical, 10 7 broad. Um, like he he is an athlete, athlete. Yeah. Uh, and at 237, he's he's thicker than a lot of linebackers these days, mm -hmm. too. So uh, you have just an absolute human missile there. Uh, the one thing is uh, he is a missile, but the, the targeting chip can be a little bit off sometimes. So, uh, you know, as, as my podcast partner EJ says, sometimes speed can get you to the wrong place faster. So, that's something that's going to have to be molded. But as far as physical tools go and potential, like he could be an early fourth ish, mid fourth round pick uh, that just has all the juice in the world. And you trust your linebacker coaches to develop him because if he develops, he could be a really, really good player. Yeah. I have him like around that third, fourth round. I think that's a good one. I would say a very dark horse here. I like Jackson Sermon a lot from Cal. Very athletic. He's probably going to go very late in the draft around that 6th, 7th, maybe even potentially undrafted, but I think he's a player who's very smart, a hard hitter, moves very well in the open field. I think he's got a potential to be a really solid linebacker. Is there anyone else that you're looking for in kind of that day three mix that you think could be pretty solid in the league? Um, I know he's going to go late, but I, I kind of like uh, Kalen Deloach from Florida State. Uh, then again, I like every defender that was on Florida State this year. That defense was absolutely stacked. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I saw him at uh, at Shrine Bowl, and um, you know, I, I, I get a lot of value seeing these guys up close and live. And I, I really liked what I saw from him. Uh, moves well. Again, he's he, he's probably going to make make the team off special teams ability, if I had to guess. But uh, as far as like developmental day three linebackers, he's up there for me. Does the size concern you at all? I know he was around 210. Does that concern you at all, or what do you think about that? It depends on the type of role we're asking him to play. You know, if he's going to be like a dimebacker, essentially, like a hybrid safety linebacker type that we're bringing in in, in nickel and dime situations or, or pass-heavy situations, um, no, it, it doesn't concern me. Do I want him in on first and 10 against, like, the Ravens? 
Probably not. <laughs> so it just depends on the role we're, tr- we're trying to have him play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the next question we've got, do you believe the J.J. McCarthy hype or is it just another smoke screen like Levis last year? Very popular question here. I, I believe it. Like I, yeah. he's, he's going top 10. I agree. I, I know for a fact he's going top 10. <laughs> so like, I believe it. And to be honest, I like McCarthy a lot more than I like Levis coming out. So like, I, I believe it for that reason too. Cause I, I get it more. I understand it more. Uh, he's got all the tools you want. He's got size, he's got arm strength. He's super coachable. He's a great leader. Um, tons of, tons of gas on the ball. Like I, I genuinely like J.J. McCarthy. Again, would I trade up for him in the top five? No, because I don't want to take him and give up those assets. But if he just fell to me, you know, at like six, yeah, I'd I, I just take him natively at six above the Giants. Yeah, and I think people look at it because Michigan didn't run a very pass-friendly offense. They ran the ball a lot. But when he was asked to throw the ball, he made some really good throws off platform on the move. He's right up there with Penix for me in terms of he could just fit the ball in any window and the receiver is the only person that's going to get it. He's got incredible ball placement. I do believe the hype. I think he's going to go top 10. Um, I know people like to compare him to Zach Wilson or Will Levis. I don't think he's anything like either of those prospects. I think he's a little bit more pro ready. Um, I think he's going to be a solid NFL quarterback. Do I think he's going to be a top five guy? Who knows? We'll see. But um yeah, I, I believe that McCarthy's probably going to go inside the top 10 as well. The next question, um, we kind of talked about it a bit earlier. Is there really a huge gap between Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors? And is there any chance that Malik Neighbors could actually go ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr.? In my personal opinion, I don't see that happening. I know other people value Malik super highly, and in their opinion, they disagree. That's totally fine. You know, We'll find out on draft day. Um, for me, they're not in the same tier. Yeah. For me, they don't even play the same position. Um, my tier one, I have Marvin Jr. and Roma Dunze in that tier with Marvin slightly ahead of Rome by like a, th- a thin margin. Uh, and then I have, I mean, I, I consider Roma Dunze like a Jamar Chase level prospect. Yeah. I love yeah. Roma Dunze. He's my wide receiver too, as well. It's very rare that I have someone on here that is as passionate about Roma Dunze as I am, but it was really interesting when you mentioned Malik Neighbors as a slot because that's something I've been saying all draft process, and most people have been just penning him in as an outside receiver. I'm like, with that speed, I think he's going to be in the slot. He's also, I believe, what is he, six foot one ninety seven? He's not the biggest receiver in the world, so I think he is primed to be a slot receiver, which is why I value Rome a little bit more. Role wise, I see him as Jalen Waddle, and Jalen Waddle's a great player. That was my comp. He was absolutely worth the pick, right? I mean, they're built a little bit different. He's bigger than Waddle, but uh, in terms of like where he's going to line up, where he does his damage, like what he does best, like it's it's Jalen Waddle. So, like, is that worth the top ten pick? Is Jalen Waddle worth the top ten pick? Absolutely, hundred percent. Like, I I love Malik Neighbors' skill set, but it's different than those other guys that line up outside and can, and can be like a true X receiver. So it just depends on what you need. If you already have outside guys and you need a, a dynamic vertical slot that also has great yak ability go ahead take malik neighbors but if you're like new england and yeah. it's like, <laughs> and we need an x <laughs> you, you don't you don't take malik neighbors to be an x you know like that that's how i look at it it's about roles and skill sets more so than like who's just better yeah absolutely uh, it's, again funny you mentioned the waddle comp that was who i compared uh, malik neighbors to back in november i think those two are very comparable and have a very similar skill set. So a good question there from Mark. The next question, how high are you guys on Nate Wiggins? Everything I'm hearing is that his fundamentals are perfect, but I can't get over his size. I feel like he'll be bullied like Forbes was last season. Interested in your thoughts. I'm I'm not super keen on small corners for exactly that reason. Because when you're going up against A.J. Brown, who's 225, and he has, not even kidding, 40 pounds on you. It doesn't matter how fast you run. Like, he's just going to beat you up. Yeah. And and it's like, do I want – so it's like, okay, if, if we don't think he has 
the size or the weight class to play against like a big body NFL X receiver that's 215, 220, 225. You're going to see a lot of those in the NFL. Uh, okay, can we move him inside? Oh, do you want him to play the run at that weight? Because that's what Nichols got to do. So now you're trying to find like, all right, where does he make sense? Like where where can we put him where it makes sense where he's not going to get beat up? Uh, and it's it's basically you're relegating him to like field side corner duty. And that's it's you know, and if you're looking at like college defenses that align field and boundary, the best, toughest, most talented corner always lines up on the boundary side because that's where your press coverage is generally going to be because uh, your passing strength is going to be to the field side. You have an isolated receiver to the boundary side. So it's one on one all day long. Like, let's have a boxing match, buddy. And then your other corner, the one that, not not that you're trying to hide, but you don't think he could survive on the boundary. You put him on the field side because those throws are are longer and, and riskier. And he's a little bit more protected by by the fact that it's a long way to go to target to target that side of the field from the far hash. Um, so that's kind of what I see Wiggins being is in a defense that aligns field and boundary, which some NFL defenses do, some don't. Some align left and right, some align strong and weak, uh, some align all of those ways depending on personnel groupings and everything like that. Um, but if I see him as like, can't put him on the boundary, he's a field side corner, he is, uh, he is like the Darius Williams to Jalen Ramsey. That can work. That's a role that can work for him. But, but in the first round, we want Jalen Ramsey. We don't want Darius Williams. You know, like so. It's just a, it's a different kind of role that I think he would he would fit in. And uh, it's 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 the third role that you're looking for among corners, not the first or the second. Yeah. So who is your number one corner? Is it Arnold? Is it Mitchell? Is it Kool Aid? Like, if it's not Wiggins, which mine is Mitchell, who would be your number one corner in the class? Uh, I'm still deciding between Quinion and Terion Arnold, uh, and I'll, I'll probably have that decision in the next week. I like them both a lot. Honestly, they're probably going to end up in the same tier, and I'll just say flip a coin. <laughs> like, they're both really good. It's it's whatever you want. Yeah, I'm there as well. Uh, the next question, with all the possibilities of teams trading up or down, what players could fall out of the top ten? We're going to tweak this. What players could fall out of the first round? Because there's a million different variabilities for the top 10. So let's just go with the first round. What is a player that maybe you see pretty highly that you could see just falling out of the first round due to positional value of other teams? Mm. It's tough to say which receiver. Cause like people have thrown out like 10 or 11 receiver names that go in the first round. They're not all going to go in the first round. There's probably going to be seven, maybe eight. But most likely seven, um, because the, I mean, literally the record is, is seven, and I think there's going to be more tackles that go than receivers. So, uh, at least a few of them. Are, I mean, I think Troy Franklin is not going to go in the first round. I know he's a very popular first rounder for people. I don't think he's going to go in the first round. Um, well, it's probably easier to list the receivers I do think are going to go first round. Uh, Marvin Jr., Rome Dunze. Uh, Adonai Mitchell, Malik Neighbors. There's no particular order. Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, I think Leggett goes first round. Keon Coleman probably goes first round. And now you're looking at like, okay, is Lad McConkey making it in? I don't think Lad makes it in. Barely misses it, but I don't think he makes it in. Um, I think Brock is going to be the only tight end. Yeah. I could see Guyton, Tyler yeah. Guyton, slipping out of the first round. I could see Kingsley Suabataya slipping out of the first round. I'm, I'm not sure on JPJ. I mean, it's easy to, to, to just slot him into Miami every single time. Mm -hmm. But if he's not going to Miami, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit dicey about where you think JPJ is going in the first round. So it, I, I could see that being like a shocker, like out of nowhere, or maybe, maybe Miami like Zach Frazier better. And then all of a sudden you're trying to figure out like, where's JPJ going to go and you can't find a spot. So I could see that one being a surprise. Um, I, I don't think Tavondre Sweat goes in the first round. I'm trying to think uh, in terms of DT, I think Johnny Newton and Byron Murphy are probably the only two. Yeah. I think Fitz would sneak in, 
but I don't I don't see that one really. It de- it depends on on what Kansas City's thinking, right? Yeah. Ah, do I think Chop is going first round? Chop's tough because I think there's like very specific teams that he would go to. Chop might be like a surprise, a surprise guy that falls out. Yeah, like if any of those sounds great on him. I'm a little bit lower on Chop. I could definitely see him falling out of the first. I don't see I don't see any linebackers going first unless it's to the 49ers and they're taking like Edger and Cooper because Dre Greenlaw, I don't know if Dre's playing this year. And then this is the last year of his deal before the void years. So like if they're already trying to plan ahead for losing Dre Greenlaw, I, I could see the Niners being like a surprise linebacker team. But other than that, I, I don't think Edge goes in the first round or Edger and Cooper goes in the first round. Um, do you consider Kamari Lasseter like a surprise fall out of the top 32? I, I don't. I never really. I think he goes probably between 40 and 50. That's kind of where I think, especially after he ran like a 4-6-4. Four, four. I just don't see him yeah. taking him in the first. Or uh, Rake Straw. I like Rake Straw a lot. I I would take him at Detroit at 29. I think he fits Dan Campbell's scheme and the way he likes to use his corners perfectly. But I don't think I don't think they go that direction. I think he probably goes inside the top 40, but maybe not the top 32. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a bunch of, that's the thing is like, there's 50 guys that you could put in your first round box Mm -hmm. and only 32 are gone, which is why teams love to accumulate picks in the top of the second round because they feel like that's the sweet spot where they're getting value. Uh, So the more, the more top 50 picks you get, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. What order will these four quarterbacks go in? JJ, Michael Penix, Drake May, Bo Nix. Uh, Drake May first, JJ second, Bo Nix third, Penix fourth is how I would see it. So there's been like this weird, maybe it's just prospect fatigue around Drake May. And a lot of people seem to be putting Jaden Daniels and JJ McCarthy ahead of Drake May. What do you think of that? Do you buy that at all? Do you still like Drake May over those guys? Or do you think there's legitimate concerns for him to fall lower than let's say a JJ and Jaden Daniels. I, I have Drake May and Jane Daniels in the same tier, but if I was just picking in a vacuum, uh, I, I would prefer Drake May. I think it depends on the situation. If we're trying to find a guy that's going to play right now, like week one, we need a guy to go in there immediately. It's probably Jaden um, because we're not sure where along in the journey Drake is in terms of like correcting his footwork issues and stuff like that. Um, but if you're asking me, like, who's going to be the better quarterback three years from now, maybe even two years from now, I, I would say Drake May. So if, if we have time for him to sit, cough, cough, Minnesota, I'd take Drake. Uh, if we need him to play right now, cough, cough, Washington, I, I could understand Jaden Daniels going there. Yeah, I'm there as well. I've got Drake slightly ahead of Jaden because I think the upside is better. Um but I think it's close. I've got the same order that you do. Drake, JJ, Bo, and Penix. Um, then another question. What is your take on Jonah Ellis, the edge out of Utah? Uh, I'm still wrapping up Jonah Ellis. I've, I've only done two games of his, but I really like what I see. Um, edge is one of the last position groups I think I'm going to finish. Uh, it's it, what, what strikes me about him is you're going through this edge class and you're and you're thinking, ah, man, after the first round, I'm not sure I'm excited about many of these guys. Like the the depth at edge this year is is not what it has been. Like there's some guys at the top we really like, but like the depth is just not there. And then you get to a guy like Jonah Ellis, and you're like, oh my god, is this the mystical third round edge that we think can get snaps as a rookie and, and hold his own? Right? Uh, I, I like the hands. I love the effort. Um, you know, better feet and hips. And I think he gets given credit for not an elite athlete, but good enough athlete. Again, I'm only two or three games into this thing. I, I want to get to like five or six for him, but um, well, let me ask you, are, are there any particular games that you recommend watching to, to make sure I get those in before I finish the eval? Let me pull up my, my sheet to look at the games that I studied for him that I really liked. Um, I really liked, I thought his game against Oregon State was really good. I thought he showed some really nice flashes there. His bend was something that I was really impressed by. He just mm-hmm. he could just go around 
the offensive lineman really, really well. Um, he probably does go in the third round. I believe he had a shoulder injury as well. But if I'm looking at some of those edge that have kind of been lotted in there, whether that's Adisa Isaac, whether that's Austin Booker, who I'm not a very big fan of, you know, some of those guys, I think I would take Ellis over them because I think the athletic upside is there. He's, like you said, a good athlete, maybe not an extremely elite athlete. Um, he's got a lot of tools that I think you could really buy into. Plus, I think coming from a football family has got to mean something. So I do think that's going to help him come draft night. Yeah, I mean, his his dad played the league for a long time. He's got brothers in the league. Uh, you know, his dad's a coach now. Like, that dude's been raised on football. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, a big thank you once again to Brett Coleman for coming on today. I had a really great time. Um, you got any closing words, anything you'd like to plug or anything you'd like to say? I'm just excited for the draft. You know, we're in the time of year where, you know, as you can tell by the bags under the eyes, <laughs> we're getting a little bit, we're getting a little bit worn down by the grind. So I'm excited for draft week to come uh, so we can all get back to sleeping and, and having a nice, easy going May and June. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again. Leave a like. I'll leave all of his links down below and I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.